Next up, uh, Dr. David Brenner from Columbia University Medical Center. He's the director of the Columbia University Center for Radiological Research, so we're going to hear from the research side of the house today. The principal investigator for the Center for High Throughput Minimally Invasive Radiation Biodosimetry, uh, much needed tool these days. Research focuses on mechanical mechanistic models of the effects of ionizing radiation on living systems. He's also a member of the National Academy's Nuclear and Radiation Studies Board and recipient of the Radiation Research Society Fela Gold Medal and Oxford University Weldon Prize. Dr. Brenner will be talking on estimating cancer risk at very low radiation doses. What can be done? Dr. Brenner. Wow, John, I see what you mean about the bright lights. Yeah. This is what the bright lights are all about. So my, my job is to talk about uh, um, uh, where we need to be but in terms of uh, research needs. What, what are the big questions? And I would argue that really the, the key question is, uh, is to do with estimating cancer risks at uh, very low doses. And what I'll try and argue is that there are a whole variety of different disciplines that really feed into that question. So I'll talk about what potentially can be done, but also who can do it. Uh, you see in this picture here, epidemiologists, radiobiologists, animal researchers, and, and statisticians all. So why are we interested in the effects of low doses of radiation? Well, I hardly need to uh, answer that question in, in this august company. But here are just a few uh, examples of, of really where we where we need to know things that we really don't know at the moment. Um, certainly the effects of, of Fukushima are probably uh, mostly below uh, where we can do any epidemiology, and uh, same really is true of Chernobyl. Uh, the future of nuclear power, really uh, one of the big issues, if you're trying to weigh up the pros and the cons, would be what are the effects of, of low-level radiation exposure. And of course, we're all worried about uh, a radiological terrorist event be it a low-dose event like a, a dirty bomb or, or a higher-dose event like an improvised nuclear device where most people still would be exposed to very low doses. And then in the medical world, we're certainly uh, interested in uh, the increase in radiation exposure due to CT scans. If we want to understand the, the risks and the, versus the benefits and try and get that balance right, then we should understand the risks. And finally, we, don't, we no longer go through uh, 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 scanners, x-ray scanners in airports. But when, when we did, there was the question of, well, the doses are extremely low, but an awful lot of people are being exposed to those low doses. So are the risks associated with that? So here's, here's the question. I mean, we, let's, let's think about a graph of radiation-associated cancer risk against dose. So there'll be one point at the origin, no dose, no risk. Um, so imagine we do some good epidemiology and we have some data points uh, and it's hard work to do large-scale epidemiology. Um, but of course, the question immediately is, well, what about lower doses? Okay, so the epidemiologists work really hard and do some lower dose stuff, but in some sense doesn't help because the next question would be, well, what about lower doses still? And of course, there are limits to what you can do in conventional radiation epidemiology. And to illustrate a little bit in this picture uh, that Evan Dupal gave me of uh, who was exposed to what doses. I think this is, this is Hiroshima. And roughly speaking, the, well, the brown spots are uh, peop, uh, represent individuals who got between five and 100 milligray, and there are about 25,000 of those people. And arguably, that's the lowest dose bin for which we can realistically get uh, um, actual data. And why is that? Why can't you go to even lower doses? Well, it, it's really because you end up in the, in the noise, in the noise of, of the background cancer risks. And here's, here's a study of uh, low dose study of, or three low dose studies of mortality in radiologists, where uh, we've looked at the, or 
the investigators have looked at the relative risks relative to appropriate controls, uh, surgeons, for example. And you see in these three different studies, um, because we're, we're right down in the noise, you can get any result you want. You can get a relative risk which is significantly raised or significantly lowered or no risk at all. So here we are right down in, in the noise. And this is really where we want to be. This is where we really need to get uh, some information. And as I say, it's really because 40% um, of us and any population are going to get cancer anyway. And so if you try and look for a very small risk over and above that 40%, it's going to be very hard. Right, and today what we have to do is scale or extrapolate cancer risks uh, from situations where we can do epidemiology down to uh, situations where we cannot. And lower doses is, is the one I'll talk about mostly, but there are other ones too, different radiation qualities, different dose rates, different populations. Now, I'll refer to that a little bit as we go along, but also a little bit to populations with different uh, uh, radiation sensitivities, uh, be it genetic or age-related. So we have all sorts of choices right now as to the appropriate methodology to extrapolate uh, measured risks down to very low doses. And, hmm, okay, well, uh, along, along the y-axis, that's, that's radiation risk. Um, but uh, you, can, you can think of a linear model or a threshold model or a, a hormesis or hermetic model, downwardly curving model. And we, we simply don't know which of these is appropriate. And they actually give very different uh, estimates of uh, risk at very low doses, of, of course. So first question is, I mean, we who, who labor in, in laboratories, can, can we help? And the answer, I think, is not, not very directly, because there are no laboratory models of radiation-induced cancer in man, uh, sort of by definition. And so, of course, we can do radiation-induced cancer in, in mice or, in, or transformation in cells, but you're always going to be then, then be faced with the question is, well, how do you apply that to, uh, to a human situation? And plus, it's also the case that even laboratory models have backgrounds, and these backgrounds become predominant as you go to these very low doses. So th th there is a standard uh, argument, there is a standard model, which essentially all the major um, regulatory bodies use, the so-called biophysical argument. And basically what, what that says is when, when you get down to a certain dose, and it's typically in the order of uh, 10 milligrade, one rad in, in the old money, um, below that uh, we're talking about exposure to single cells, and, in the, and then everything becomes linear. Uh, at higher doses, all, all bets are off. We don't really know what's happening. But if we could estimate risks at around 10 milligrade, one rad, then we would be able to extrapolate risks to lower doses. Now, I'll say that that's an argument. That's, that's not, not uh, a statement of fact, or at least not a statement of fact that I know. And I'll talk a little bit about what are the uncertainties in that argument. I can't, obviously, in my time, go into details of the argument. But uh, what this does tell us is that it would be great if we knew some, some risks at uh, 10 milligray, one rad, and we, then we could anchor some of our studies based on that. Really make a list of, of our big research needs. And number one is epidemiological evaluation of cancer risks in this region, in this one rad, 10 milligray uh, region. Now that's, that's very hard indeed. And, uh, the epidemiologists among us will kind of shake their heads and say it's impossible. Um, and probably it is today, but that's a, f a future need. Um, so what things can you do? Well, you can optimize uh, your epidemiological study to basically be as uh, powerful as you possibly can. And for example, you can make the study very, very big. And uh, John Boyce's Million Worker Study is, is an example of that, where you simply uh, try, and, try and have very, very good statistics. Or you can think about radiation biomarkers, because 
I mean, if, if you had a biomarker so that you could tell that this radiation actually was radiation induced, then, then most of the, uh, the problems about background cancer risks would go away because you're not then looking at, uh, you'd be able to specifically look at radiation induced cancers only. Um, because we don't really have valid, such things, such validated radiation biomarkers. Although th there have been some studies, uh, or some suggestions from, from Chernobyl in the thyroid cancers that maybe there is a gene signature specific to radiation. Personally, I'm, I'm a little somewhat skeptical. But again, that's a, that is an area of research. Can we find specific radiation biomarkers? Because if we could, um, we certainly could do lower dose uh, radiation induced cancer risk studies. My feeling is that actually we're in better shape at high LET with, uh, with radon or something like that because there are some more mechanistically based high LET biomarkers. So I, I talked about the biophysical model and I said it, it is the biophysical argument and I said it really is a model and makes a, a whole bunch of implicit and explicit assumptions that we would want to question. So that is a thing perhaps that uh, um, biologists, uh, radiation biologists can do is to look at the individual assumptions that go into the biophysical argument and try and test them one by one. And really the three areas uh, that we're talking about are first of all DNA repair and then immunosurveillance and cell-to-cell -cell communication. Basically, do these change as you go to very low radiation doses or not? And really, my own personal point of view is, is, is the one that's, that's really central of these three is, is the third one, the one on the right, right, cell-to-cell uh, -cell communication. But in, in general, the, the various assumptions that go into the uh, models that eventually turn into, into a linear no-threshold model are testable, and I think that's something we should probably put more e emphasis on. As I say, I, my own feeling is that the issue of intercellular communication is really the biggest of these three, and perhaps the most questionable uh, assumption of all, because the biophysical argument talks about the development of tumors from damage from individual cells, which which uh, basically develop independent of one another. And we know cancer isn't like that, and we know cancer is, is all about cell-to-cell -cell communication. But we don't really know what that means in terms of the, uh, the argument. You know, are radiation carcinogenic mechanisms uh, amplified or, or counteracted by communication mechanisms? Well, we really don't know that. But again, that's an area where we have the possibility of doing more research. Yeah, so my view, we, we know very little about the significance of cell-to-cell -cell communication uh, in, in radiation carcinogenesis, and we certainly could use laboratory models uh, to, to move in that direction. Just briefly, I mean, we know that cells in tissues talk to each other, but we really don't know what that would mean. Um, one, one area that people have researched quite a lot um, uh, is, is the so-called radiation-induced bystander effect, where a, a cell is irradiated and its neighbor cell, which was not irradiated, still reflects the damage from the, radiation, from the irradiated cell. So information is somehow getting from a, an irradiated cell to a non-irradiated cell. But we don't, and, and general, generally speaking, when people have looked at uh, bystander effects, they, they, they see dose response curves which saturate, which, which are downwardly curving. So this might be the picture of what a low-dose radiation uh, versus radiation-induced cancer uh, graph would, would look like. Uh, and if, if that was really true, then that would actually mean that uh, linearity would underestimate radiation risks. But of course, we don't know the relevance of bystander effects to radiation carcinogenesis at all. So big need number two on my list uh, you can see from my slide, I'm not going to have many of big needs, um, is, is to look at cell-to-cell uh, -cell communication effects and particularly bystander effects and just to see quite how they relate to radiation-induced carcinogenesis, what the multicellular effects do to radiation-induced carcinogenic mechanisms. 
Okay, so my, my third issue. Um, so who, who gets radiation-induced cancer? So we know that uh, if you irradiate a population, um, there will be a small increase in cancer risk in that population, meaning some peop a very few people will get a radiation-induced cancer, most won't. So how is that? Is, is that just the, uh, the, the, the roll of the dice? Or is there, some, is there some underlying reason why the people who got radiation-induced cancer did? Um, so is it largely confined to radiation-sensitive subgroups, or is it purely random? And the, the, there is one paper, and only one that I can see, that really directly addresses that. And that's from the study, uh, the Israeli study of uh, tinea capitis, where individuals, as you all probably know, irradiated uh, in the 1950s for, for ringworm. And uh, so there was a, a very large population that were exposed. Um, and some of the obvious cancers appeared, like radiation-induced meningioma and thyroid cancer. Um, so the early studies were population-based studies. But more recent studies by uh, Sigal Sadetsky uh, did look at uh, familial effects here and really found them specifically in radiation-induced cancer, radiation-induced meningioma. So basically, she looked at a, a bunch of families where many siblings, and often the parents too, were irradiated, and what she saw was a very familial effect for radiation-induced cancer, but not a familial effect for, uh, for background meningioma. So it was limited to radiation-induced uh, cancer. So what you see here is a, a mother and father and a group of si siblings. The purple siblings were irradiated, um, and the bluey-green uh, siblings got meningioma. So four of the, uh, of the six uh, siblings who were irradiated got, uh, got radiation-induced meningioma. And she had 50 or so families, I, I believe, and really made a pretty convincing case, at least in this case, radiation-induced meningioma. What we're seeing is a, uh, is a familial radi radiation-induced carcinogenic carcinogenesis uh, effect. Almost all the radiation-associated cancers occurred in just a very few families. Um, um, so the susceptibility uh, was specific to those families and was not uh, specific to radiation, to, to meningioma in general. The background was not familial, and, and that's sort of known that meningioma is not a familial cancer. So I might just imagine this is true generally, that uh, if we expose this, this room to uh, a low dose of radiation, the people who are going to get cancer are pretty predictable. They're going to be the people who have some radi uh, genetic sensi sensitivity to uh, radiation, and the rest won't. So, so what that, I mean, it would basically throw the whole of the radiation protection uh, operation as we have it today really to the wind because it would be no good trying to protect for an average individual because you would be, uh, you'd have limits which was too strict for, uh, for most people but not strict enough for those few people who are radiation sensitive. So it's a, it's, a, it's a really big question in the, in the radiation protection world and one that we don't... Well, we have an answer for meningioma, I think. We certainly don't have an answer for radiation-induced cancer in general. So that's my big need number three. We need to understand the significance of inter individual radiation sensitivity and radiation carcinogenesis. And I don't have great ideas for how you go about that. Um, perhaps studies with... Uh, outbred mice is one possibility. Uh, perhaps large-scale screening of radiosensitivity in, in whole populations might be possible. I don't think we quite know how to do that at the moment. But uh, I think it's, this is a major issue and one that has enormous implications for, for our whole community. The, the, the question which uh, we all face at some points in our, in our careers, and how do we deal with the, the fact that we really don't know at this point what uh, radiation-induced cancer risks are at low doses? We all have our good, good notions, but uh, I think we have to all admit that there's major uncertainties. 
And there's a quote from Voltaire, um, essentially saying that uh, um, uncertainty is, is, is clearly not a, not a very nice thing, but uh, the, the contrary, assurance is, is, is kind of crazy. So the reason I put that up is I don't, I don't think it's useful to um, perhaps fool ourselves that we really know what's going on when, when we don't. I mean, when we get down to very low doses, we are seriously uncertain, and we have to deal with that uh, uncertainty. So I, th I think we can't provide accurate, defensible estimates of individual uh, risks or population risks uh, when we get down to very low uh, radiation doses. And that's a problem. Um, what, what we can do um, very easily is actually provide upper limit estimates. And that, that I think, we, could, we can potentially all agree upon. Uh, it would be a statement like, like I've written in the yellow box here. Low dose risks can't be more than so and so, because if they were, they would, be, uh, they would have shown up in, in, in past low dose studies. So although we don't know whether the risks are small or zero, what we can do is say, well, they can't be bigger than this because uh, we would have seen them. And y you could think how that, that would have worked to our advantage, uh, for example, in, in, in Fukushima. So probably everybody in this room, or almost everybody in this room, would agree that the individual radiation-related cancer risks uh, for, for almost anybody at Fukushima are very, very small. So that we can agree on, probably. Um, that said, there is no doubt that uh, you go to Japan and you see uh, a huge anxiety and skepticism about uh, individual risks and population risks. And it's not too surprising because uh, the general public gets mixed messages. And it gets, gets mixed messages because we really don't know what the risks are at very low doses. This notion of using upper, upper limit risk estimates to an extent gets around that because, in fact, the, the community, the, the Sign the radiation community as a whole could potentially agree on uh, upper limit risk estimates without the need to argue about whether the risks are zero or very, very small. So that would be, that would be the fourth and, and the last of my four uh, areas where I think we have major needs and potentially uh, we, solvable needs is to generate upper limit risk estimates. So we have four areas, um, epidemiology at low doses, understanding the significance of multicellular effects, understanding the significance of inter-individual radiation sensitivity, and generating low dose, generating upper limit risk estimates. So I put on the right-hand side what, generically speaking, you might imagine what, what group of people might take on which problem. So as the epidemiologists on the top, and the radiation biologists, the animal researchers, and the statisticians. But actually, it's clearly not that uh, cut and dried, and perfectly well might be other groups, and, and no doubt it's, it's these folks working together which have the potential to, uh, uh, to really understand and solve some of these problems, which I think are solvable. So I'll, I'll uh, conclude, and my argument was the big question we need to know about is understanding cancer risks at very low doses. And I've argued there are a variety of sub-questions within that which are very interesting questions and are questions which any of the disciplines associated with you in the audience could potentially uh, um, put your hands upon. And there I'll stop and happy to receive questions at the end of the session, right?